Good morning. Good morning. Stand and help us sing this morning. When I look all around and see the good things that he does for me. So much to thank Him for And I've got so much to thank Him for So much to praise Him for You see, He's been so good to me When I think, I think of what He's done And when, and when He's brought So much to thank Him for And I've got so much to thank Him for So much to praise Him for You see, He's been so good to me And when I think I think of what He's done And where He's brought me so much to thank Him for, and when I think, I think of what He's done and where He's brought me from, I had so much to thank Him for. Amen. sing it before the preacher comes. God is so good. God is so good. God Sing it out this morning. 
Yes, God. Sing it. Yes. Yes. Amen. Ain't God good? How many of you believe he's better than good? I'll give him a real hand clap of praise this morning. Praise be unto the Lord. What a great meeting we've had, series of meetings this weekend, how God is blessed. And uh, we're, we're coming, boy, down to the last few services today, which I always just thoroughly enjoy, just as much as any part of it. And uh, so we're going to ask at this time, it's good to have my friend. I met him a few years ago, and uh, we've, we've gotten closer uh, every year, one to another. I appreciate his, the legacy that his great-grandfather has left behind, Ralph Sexton Sr., and then Ralph Sexton Jr., his grandfather, out at Trinity Baptist Church in Asheville, North Carolina. And I want you to make him welcome this morning, Winston Parrish. Thank you, Pastor Chris. I appreciate that. Isn't it good to be in God's house this morning? Oh, come on. Y'all got to do better than that. Isn't it good to be in God's house this morning? Amen. I was on the way here, and I stopped at a gas station, and uh, there was a guy trying to fill his boat up. He was trying to get some fuel in his pontoon, and he tried four different pumps. And I wanted to look at him and say, man, I think the Lord would just have you come on to church with me. You go to the lake later. But I'm so glad that you're here tonight, this morning, and uh, I appreciate the invitation. I love Pastor Chris Rumfelt, your family, what you stand for. You're the real deal, and I appreciate you so very much. Yes, give him a round of applause. Amen. The Lord's been good to us, and uh, I'm thankful for all the times we get to work together and how God set things up and in motion, and the Lord's good to us. I know you're tired. I, we'll be real. I know you're tired. I know you've had a lot of fun. And to have the preaching that you've had already, it's kind of like drinking out of a fire hydrant. Yeah. They've turned it on. You're trying to get a little sip of water. And I understand that. But I don't think God's done with what he wants to do in this building this morning. I think there's more to be done. And I think the Lord has something for someone today. Yeah. I don't think it's over. And uh, I've had that burden since I came in the building last night that God has more to do. And was that not an incredible message last night by Pastor Wesley? My goodness, what an incredible message. But for just a few minutes, here's what I would invite you to do. I want you to take the distractions of the world, everything going on in your life, I know reality starts back probably on Tuesday for a lot of you. Maybe you're finishing up school. Maybe school's already done and the summer's beginning for you and you're getting ready to start a job. Or maybe your parents are like my parents and if you're not at school, you're at work and you've got a lot to do coming up. But before we get into that portion of your life, let's take a break. Let's pause. Let's slow everything down. We live in such a fast-paced world. It's fast, it's instant, it's instantaneous. I want us to take a break for just a minute. I want you to take a deep breath, and I want you to get into the chapel of your own heart. Don't worry about what's going on beside you, behind you, in front of you. Just ask the Holy Spirit of God to do something for you today. And that's what we're going to do. Stand to your feet for just a minute. Go to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, stand to your feet. Luke chapter 4. Uh, I, I pulled some of the students here on this row here. I had a one hour, an hour and a half. I had a couple ladies that said they actually slept three hours. You can operate on three hours. You can't operate on one hour. So here's what I'm going to have you to do before we read God's word. Here's what I want you to do. If you slept for an hour last night, I want you to raise your hand. That's all you got was an hour. Okay, I've got a couple hands. If you slept for two hours, raise your hand. 
Two, you got two right there. If you were able to get three hours, raise your hand. Oh, right, three hours, fantastic. Here's what I want you to do. The ones of you that raised your hands that you got one or two hours, you go ahead and lay down, take you a nap, I'll wake you up in 15 minutes, okay? Not really. Here's what I want you to do. Luke chapter four, and let's go to verse 14. Luke chapter four, verse 14. It says, and Jesus returned in the power of the spirit into Galilee. And there went out a fame of him through all the region around about. And verse 15 says, and he taught in their synagogues being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. In verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he, being Jesus, closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of them that were there in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, this day, this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, for the next few minutes, dear God, would you please hide me behind the cross? God, these students don't need to see another character. They don't need to see someone popular on Facebook or Instagram. Father, we need the Holy Spirit of God to come into this place. And Father, I surrender myself to you as a sacrifice. God, you do with me what you want to do today. God, use my stammering lips of clay. God, to be used to preach what you would have us preach this morning. God, use the message and the power of the Holy Spirit. May it have liberty in this place. God, if there's a student here today that's dealing with pornography, God, if there's a student here today that's dealing with addiction, Father, if there's a student here today that's not saved, Father, I pray today would be that intersection. Oh, Holy Spirit of God, do your work. In thy name I pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. You may be seated. I want to set this up for you because I want you to understand exactly what's going on. Again, I know you're tired. I know you've had a long weekend, but please stay with me. I want you to get this. I want you to understand just exactly what was going on. And Jesus has just finished his 40 days of temptation with Satan. He's come out of that experience, and we know that he remained God. He remained all man through that temptation, and he was victorious, and he comes out of that temptation, and it says that he returns to the area of Galilee in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I can't help but think, because he's all God and he's all man, Jesus, the Christ, the man, the God, is living in a place of victory. He's just spent 40 days in the desert being tempted by Satan, and he comes out victorious. Victorious. And it says he returns back to the area of Galilee there in the power of the Holy Spirit. And it says that because of what Jesus is doing, now remember, Jesus has been teaching all around this area. He's been preaching the good news. He's been performing miracles. And his mannerisms, the way he is treating people, such as lepers, such as people that don't uh, have a status in society, the way he's been treating people, it's giving him a sort of fame. He's known for what he's doing. And it says that he returns to Galilee and specifically to Nazareth. And it says that he's been keeping the customs as a Jew. He's going to synagogue on the Sabbath. Jesus is practicing as a Jew, doing what Jews do. He goes to synagogue. So he's there and he goes back to Nazareth, the old home place. Now, I know some of us in here are from Hayesville. Some of you are from Hawassi. Some of you, I don't know where you're from. But there's nothing like going back home. 
I lived as a missionary's kid for 12 years. I lived a year in Mexico, uh, back and forth for a year in Cuba, and then I lived almost 10 years in Costa Rica. And every time, even when Costa Rica became home and I, I had my school and I had my friends and finally God had blessed me to be able to learn the language to make friends and order food at McDonald's, trust me, you get tired of beans and rice. It gets old fast. And you want to have a friend, you want to go find a hamburger, like all good Americans do. And even when I got comfortable there and God did all these things for me, it was so good, Brother Chris, getting on that U.S. Airways flight out of San Jose and landing in Charlotte, knowing that I was two hours from Asheville. There's nothing like going home. And Jesus goes home to Nazareth, and I believe that there is no accident. How many believe your Bible is completely true? Every word, every jot, every tittle, Amen. And I believe that he was in Nazareth, and I believe that he was in Nazareth for a reason. It is no accident that Jesus has returned to his home place where he grew up as a little boy. It's no accident. And he's there, and as we know in Jewish custom, that's why it's so important, and your pastor here at First Free Will you know that understanding Jewish custom and how things were 2,000 years ago is so important. And that's why we still make trips to the Holy Land to study out these customs and see them come alive. Well, the custom in the day was that there would be a signed reading in the synagogue. Every year, the Jew was to go through the Torah, the scrolls. What we would have is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They would go through those books and they would read them throughout the calendar year. And so Jesus comes through to the Torah and the selected reading for that day happened to be the prophet of Isaiah. And then the New Testament is, says there, Isaiah. But it's the Old Testament Isaiah. Turn with me, this is the last time I'll make you turn, to Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah chapter 61. And I'll apologize to the media team, I didn't give you this verse but I appreciate it. Aren't you thankful this weekend for the media team that's here? Let's give them a round of applause. They've done a lot of work with the cameras, recordings, live stream. That's a lot of work, folks, and I appreciate them. Isaiah 61.1. So let's set this up. Stay with me. Jesus goes back to this home place where he grew up. We know he wasn't born there, but this is where he grew up in Nazareth. And he walks into the synagogue. And it's this scripture, Isaiah 61, that he is to read. Now, I just said the Bible has no accident inside from cover to cover. And ladies and gentlemen, it was no accident that this was the scripture to be read. And so Jesus takes the scroll, gets it from the minister of the synagogue, and he stands to read, and he reads this. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Amen. And at the end of this, he reads it, and it blows everybody's mind that he stops. Why? Because if we go on in verse number 2 of Isaiah 61, it says to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance our God. Now listen, we got to remember where we're at here. We got to remember where we're at here. Roman occupation. They hate what Rome has done. And these Jews, these law-abiding, law-keeping Jews are looking for somebody to take over. They're looking for a conqueror, a military leader. They're looking for someone that's going to come in and join all the forces together and throw the Roman occupation out. So he gets there to this verse 61.1 and reads it and stops and looks at them and says, Hey, today, right now, this very moment, the scripture that I just read into your hearing, it's fulfilled. I'm here. I am Messiah. And it's a big place. And so the people are looking around and it says that they're astonished. They're astonished. This guy just came in here and said, he's the son of God. It's huge. It's huge. And it says that they're astonished. And they look at them with their mouths wide open. Did you hear what he just said? But he stopped. You see, Jesus, 
Listen, teenager, listen, young adult. Jesus wasn't there to conquer men by force. He was there to conquer hearts with love. And I'm afraid the whole point of today's message is for us to do what I said at the very beginning. We as a church, as a society, as a group of a body of believers, we've got to step back. We've got to take a deep breath. We're going to have to look at this thing and we're going to have to reevaluate some things. Listen, you're teenagers, yes, but the 15-year-old of today is in no way, shape, form, or fashion the 15-year-old that I was in 2005 when God saved me. It's totally different. Parents, teachers, youth pastors, laymen, listen to what I'm saying. We have to address the problems that these students are facing head on. We can't walk around it anymore. We can't beat the bush about it. We've got to get real. We've got to get on our knees. And we've got to beg God for this next generation. We have to. Listen, it's not fair. It's not right. We're setting them up for failure if we don't. And listen to me, teenagers. I'm sorry Things are the way they are. My God in heaven, I'm sorry we didn't do better. I'm sorry we didn't set things up to be easier. We've played games long enough, and I'm sorry that you have to deal with what you have to deal with. I'm sorry. But listen to me. There's hope. There's hope. And I know you've had a long weekend and I know you're drained, but Jesus is in this building today and he's got a message for the student, for the teenager, for the young adult, maybe for the youth worker about to give up. There is hope. Hold on. And if we go back to this verse in Luke chapter four and we break it down and understand what Jesus was saying and how he was saying it, he goes and he says this, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. In other words, he was identifying the capacity in which he was operating. He wasn't there as a madman. He wasn't there as a lunatic. He wasn't there as a liar. He was there with the full power of God Almighty at his disposal. He made it clear right here. You don't have to worry. You don't have to doubt. You don't have to fear. I'm here in the capacity of God himself. I am all God. I am all man. And I am here in this synagogue in Nazareth today. And the same truth that Jesus spoke in this synagogue 2,000 years ago is still true today. And we've got to have it. We've got to have this truth. He says that the Lord has anointed me. Well, if he's all God and he's all man, why would he have to be anointed? Listen to me. We got to remember what happened with John the Baptist. Remember Jesus is baptized. John the Baptist looks at him and says, I'm not even worthy enough to take off your sandals. And he baptizes him there in the Jordan River. The dove comes, the voice of God the Father's there. And for the first time, we see the Trinity proven. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And your Lord and Savior, young person, is operating with the full power available to God himself. This Jesus of today that's watered down, that's made weak and sissy and all accepting. It's not the Christ of the Bible. I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm not trying to hurt your feelings. But Jesus was a man of character. He was a man of statue. He was a man of virtue. And he was God. And he had no sin. And he had no vile fault. And he had no vile action. He was God. And he stands in this synagogue and he says, this is me. I'm here. Pay attention. And this morning, sitting in this building today, young person, you need to be still. Pay attention and listen because this is the only hope you've got. You can continue to do what you're doing. You can keep walking the line, straddling the fence, playing games. Listen, you can fool your mama. You can fool your daddy. You can fool your youth worker. You can fool your teachers at school. You can fool your coaches. You can fool everybody. You're good at it. 
You're set up to succeed in that practice. Listen, Snapchat is God awful. I hate it. I've had teenager after teenager after young person and then they go into the singles ministry and they're carrying around the same problem that started with an app that allows you to have a secret conversation and send secret pictures that erase in 10 seconds. My God in heaven, you're set up to fail. And I'm sorry. I know it's tough. I know it's hard, but there's hope. And it's in Jesus today. Listen, I'm going to be real with you. I'm going to be real. I love being a Baptist. I love it. We have fun. We go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, missions conference, revival meetings, tent meetings, going on the boat with Brother Chris. I love being a Baptist. I'll be a Baptist until the day I die. I'm proud of our heritage. I'm proud that we've stood for the book. I'm proud of where we've come and what we paid to get there. I'm proud of that. I love that. But I'm going to tell you something, young person. You can be the best Baptist sit on the front row all your life, and it doesn't mean a hill of beans. You hear me? The Baptist denomination will not save your soul. The Baptist denomination will not protect you from sin. Only a relationship with Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, through the indwellment of the Holy Spirit is going to make a difference. You can be a Baptist, you can be Presbyterian, you can be Methodist, but if you're not saved and you don't have a relationship that's continual every single day of your life with Jesus, you're set up to fail. And Jesus says, you don't have to worry, young person, in 2019, 2,000 years later, because I have come. And he lists all the things that are available. Oh, are you getting that? Are you holding on to that? What's getting you through your day? What's getting you through your day? Pastor Chris talked about it last night. Is it what's on your phone? I don't even know where mine is. It's down there somewhere. Is it what's on your phone? Is that what you're looking for? Is that what you're after? A couple of more hearts on Instagram? Is that, is that what life is? Is that it? I'm not being ugly. I, I, I have an Instagram. I like to post pictures of my wife and her puppies. She's watching on Facebook. Our puppies. I love it. It's great. The gospel is spread every day on platforms like Facebook, Instagram. Sure, they're great. But is that what life is? Is that what it's all about? You post a picture of yourself in your baseball uniform, throwing a football, whatever you do, eating your ice cream, eating your avocado toast. Is that life? No! That's not life. Life is you get a job and you pay bills and you have to pay insurance and you've got to go to school and you've got to make something of yourself. And if you've been saved, you have at your disposal the king of the universe. He's at your fingertips. He's at your lips. All you got to do is say, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And you know what? The church has made such a turn. We've made such a turn. It's no longer about what we can do for Jesus. It's about what can the church do for me so my life's easier. And and that's just where we are, young person. So what's going to change? What's going to be different about your generation? Where's it going to change? It starts right here. It retreats like this. It does. You've, You've heard truth preached all weekend. You've seen opportunities to worship. And I I saw some of you last night. Man, you're like this. Y'all closed up. Even some of you ladies, y'all closed up. I don't want to sing. Somebody might be looking. I don't want to raise my hand and thank God for saving me. Somebody might see. But can I tell you why you feel that way? All right, let me tell you. I'm glad you asked. 
You feel that way because some of you, when you came in here last night or when you got here Friday, it was the first time all week you had worshiped. It was the first time you had to go find your Bible. And you come here and you expect these great, marvelous, magical things to happen. I'm sorry, this ain't Harry Potter. You don't get your little wand out and wave it. It's got to be a real, tangible thing for you. It's a relationship. We're not here because it's fun and it's all good and we're all here in this place and space. That's not what it's about. It's about a relationship. And if you're here and you have one with Jesus and he saved you, then when you wake up in the morning, you have to remember what it said in Luke 4, what Jesus was saying. Remember what he said. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel. What is the gospel? Somebody say it loud. You know it. What is the gospel? The good, the good news. He said, I'm here to preach good news. What was the good news? The good news was that there is a way to heaven through the power and blood of Jesus Christ. And some of us have lost that. We've been saved and we've been coming to church, but we've lost our first love. The gospel. Who was it for? Who was the gospel for? Answer me. Who's it for? Who, what? Whosoever. Everybody. It's good news. And listen, young person. If God's done that in your heart, the outward appearance on your face should be a little different than that of the world. Do you hear what I said? Your, your face is going to look different. When your parents tell you to do something, it doesn't come back with this slap you in the face attitude. It comes back with this, I'm a teenager that loves Jesus, and yes, mom, dad, you make me so mad I could set this house on fire. But because I love you and because I love the Lord, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. We've lost that. Listen, it, it, it's so simple. If Jesus is living inside of you, things on the outside will be different. Your desires to listen to different music will change. Some of you know good and well that you need to go home and go to iTunes or go to Spotify, I think is what it's called, and you need to delete some junk. You can't listen to the world all week. Well, I like to get it uh, pumping when I uh, go to the gym. Listen. Listen to me. Listen. You keep feeding yourself that stuff, it's going to come out on the other end. It will. It'll happen. Find something that brings honor and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. You've been saved. Act like it. He said, I've come to preach the gospel. And then he said to preach to the poor. Listen, I'm almost done. Stay with me. I don't want you to miss this. He said, I came to preach to the poor. Well, Pastor Winston, are you telling me the gospel's just for poor people? No. I'm telling you that what Jesus was saying, the word in the Greek is pipto. Not pepto like Pepto-Bismol, but pipto. The word's pipto. I love that word. I've said it all week. Pipto. Say it with me. Pipto. Pipto. My wife's tired of hearing pipto. But hey, do you know what pipto means? When I'm sitting in my office and this word popped off of that Strong's Concordance, I about lost my stinking mind. I could have picked up my desk and thrown it. That word pipto means this. To fall, to fail, to be down literally physically. Do you know what Jesus was saying? Do you know what Jesus was saying? I've come to preach to the ones who are fallen. I've come to preach the good news to the ones who have failed. And I have come to preach to the ones who are weighed down in the miry clay of sin. And I'm going to reach them out of there. And I'm going to set them up here. And I'm going to give them a new name. I'm going to wash them off and I'm going to make them clean. And all the past and all the mistakes and all the failures and all the falling will be obsolete. Because he's Jesus 
And he said, I came to preach to those people. If you can identify this morning as one of those people, wave at me real big. Gosh, both of my arms are waving big. I have fallen, I have failed him, but Jesus, but Jesus, but Jesus, but Jesus. Jesus. Teenager, that's all you've got to hold on to. I know you have your mom and your dad and your grandparents and your youth pastor and your pastor and your friends at school, but can I tell you something in love? They're human. They're human. My grandfather loves me. He's cared for me. He's invested in me. He's given me, he's my boss. (sighs) Talk about real. He's my best friend, my traveling buddy. I love that man. I love my grandmama who's in heaven now. I loved her. She was my prayer partner. I was on the way over here and I was thinking, gosh, I'd love to call her and ask her to pray. But you know what? I can't. At the end of the day, young person, you've got to hold on to what's real, what's tangible, and it's this word and the truths that lay within it. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. He said, I've come to preach to the poor. He said, I've come to heal the brokenhearted. Wave at me if you've ever had a broken heart. Gosh, I have. Oh, my. Some of my own doing, I've had a broken heart. I couldn't feel like I'd get out of the bed and go another day. I've lost a grandparent, I've lost a parent. Whatever your situation is, maybe that's your broken heart. Maybe your broken heart is you've you've got sin in your life and it's called separation. Remember this, sin is a separator. It'll always divide. It will never bring together. And if you're saved and you're on your way to heaven and you allow sin to creep in, it'll always separate you from the things you're supposed to be doing, the people you're supposed to be doing it with. Maybe that's your broken heart. I've got hidden sin. Maybe there's a teenage boy. Can somebody come help me on the piano for just a second? I'm about done. Maybe there's a teenage boy in here this morning. And maybe why you have such a broken heart is because you've got a horrible porn addiction. And you can't tell nobody about it. I mean, let's let's just be real. Statistically, every single one of you that's in high school has seen pornography. That's getting real. That's at surface level. Well, I go to Christian school. Guess what? It's still in the Christian schools. Well, I'm homeschooled. You got an iPad? You got a computer? You got a phone? Listen, the devil doesn't play fair, young person. And where the church has made some major failures where we've played games and cut and stabbed at each other instead of loved on each other, and you've had to see that. Maybe you've grown up in a broken home and you got hurt at church. Hey, that's real. That's real. Maybe some of you have a mommy that you can't find. You don't know where she's at. Maybe you've got a dad you've never even met before. Maybe all dad is to you is a child support check. That's real. And it hurts. And when Jesus stood up in that synagogue in Nazareth, you know what he said? I love you. I'm sorry. Life's been tough. I care for you. I know your name. I see the tears that you're crying at night that mom doesn't know about, that dad doesn't know about, that your teachers at school don't know about. He sees every one of those tears. He sees them. And maybe you're here today and you're in this huge crowd of people and you feel all alone. You feel like you don't fit in. You feel like you even shouldn't be here. Maybe you got invited, a friend from school, and you're thinking, my goodness, when's this going to be over? Can I tell you something? Jesus loves you too. And when he stood up in that synagogue in Nazareth, he said, I'm here to heal the broken hearted and if you've got a broken heart this morning Jesus cares Jesus loves you listen I'm going to ask the media team I want you to pay attention we're, we're closing with this I'm going to ask the media team to put up that first picture this first picture on your screen is a young man and I had to make some notes on him this young man his name's Devin Erickson. 
Devin Erickson. He's 18 years old. He's a senior at Highlands Ranch High School right outside of Denver, Colorado. And two Tuesdays ago, Devin got on Facebook. And Brother Chris, he wrote a rhetorical question as a post. And he wrote this. He was asking, he said, do you know what I hate? Do you know what I hate? He asked himself. And he replied, I hate Christians. That, that was his response. And Devin, you see, he was living a lifestyle that God couldn't accept. The devil was tormenting him. There's no telling what he was looking at, what he was listening to. I don't know, but that's Devin. And Devin walks into his high school there at Highlands Ranch, about 20 miles outside of Denver, with a loaded handgun. And Devin goes into his classroom where he would have been. It's end of school year, so they're watching a movie for English class. These students, they're just sitting there watching a movie in English class. Everybody's excited. It's getting ready to be the end of school. The, the testing's over. And Devin walks in with a heart full of hate, manipulated by the world. And he begins to fire his handgun. Go to the next picture, please. This young man, his name's Kendrick Castillo. And Kendrick was in that English class. Let me tell you something real quick about Kendrick. He loves anything to do with mechanics. He loves cars, he loves planes, he loves trains, he loves engineering, he loves engineering science. That's what he wants to do for a living. He wants to go to college and work hard and get a degree and get a job and that's his hopes, dreams and aspirations. And when Devin walks in with a handgun and begins taking out his pain and affliction on his friends and his classmates, Kendrick stands up and he charges Devin. He tackled him, brought him to the ground. And as he charged his classmate with a handgun, he was fatally wounded. And it cost him his life. It cost him his life. He was the only student that died that day. Seven or eight others were injured. And teenagers, young adults, Parents, youth workers, listen to me. You would think the appropriate response to this right outside Denver, Colorado would be to have a night or a day of mourning that we'd shut down the city, we'd hold candles and we'd sing. That that would be the American way to do it. We'll go mourn the, this loss, this next shooting. It's happened, and we're going to go mourn it. I would like to tell you that's what happened. But you see, this high school where this happened is at 2937 Crest Hill Lane. And 23 miles from that high school at 200 East Colfax Avenue is the Colorado State Capitol. It's 23 miles. Google Maps told me 31 minutes in the car with traffic. 30 minutes from this high school where these kids were shot and killed. Just 30 minutes is the state capital. The place where things are supposed to be able to change, right? The place we would all go to mourn this terrible tragedy. But instead of having a day or a night of mourning, the state of Colorado instead stayed in session to vote and unanimously pass a law allowing psychedelic mushrooms to be legalized. They've already legalized marijuana. So that night, in honor of Mr. Kendrick Castillo, who charged the shooter, who saved his classmates, the state of Colorado decided this is how we'll honor this student. We'll legalize more drugs. That's how they responded. And meanwhile, while moms and dads, listen to me good here, moms and dads, while we're playing games, while we're tearing down the preacher, 
While we're making comments that are rude and ugly about deacons and other people in the church. Meanwhile, while the, the pews in church begin to stack up with cold, dead, complacent Christians, the warm blood of innocent children rolls down the hallways. And the church who's supposed to be making the difference is playing games. What's wrong with us? I'm talking to the parents. What's wrong with us? Mama, when was the last time you took your babies in your living room and got down in the living room and they heard you pray over them? God, protect my baby when he goes to school. God, protect my baby when he's online. God, protect my baby from the wrong relationships. Daddies, when's the last time after supper you grabbed your Bible and said, family, let's turn off our phones. Let's turn off our TV. Let's read our Bible. It's the only hope we've got. It's the only hope we've got. I didn't come here today to yell and scream at you and make you mad. I came here to warn you in love. We've got to do something. Teenagers, it's up to you. Mom and dad will go to heaven one day. You'll have your kids of your own. You'll have your grandkids of your own. It'll happen. It happens fast. And life's brutal. What are you going to hold on to? You got to see Jesus for who he is. Who he was that day in Nazareth is who he is today. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Stand to your feet. I feel like I've said enough. If God's done something in your heart, you need to come pray. Mamas and daddies, you come find your babies and pray. God, please. God, may this be a place of renewal, of restoration. God, for these teenagers, these students who need to see something that's real, God, may today be the day they make the decision. I want to hold on to Jesus. Father, for the parents, for the grandparents, for the single mothers, God, for the single fathers, Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you'd give them strength to lead their homes. God, that you would give them strength to be the light and the salt that Christ commanded us to be. And Father, for our churches, oh God, for our churches, oh God, would you send revival to our churches. Oh God, would you encourage the preacher that's about to quit. Father, would you encourage the Sunday school worker that's about to give up? Father, would you do something? Lord, we need you. God, we're so tired of politics. God, we're so tired of hurting the body of Christ. Lord, we want to be clean. We want to be real. And we want to be consecrated unto thee. God, do it. Oh, God, do it. Oh, God, you're so holy. God, you're so worthy. God, we're so undeserving to even say your name. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I plead the blood of Christ over these students. God, don't let Satan have one more. God, don't let the world claim another family. Oh, God, encourage them. God, let them see that it's real. God, I pray in your precious holy name. Sing a verse of something. Do you remember when you were drowning in a sea of sin, going down for the last time when you called upon his name? He reached down his nail-scarred hand And he lifted you out There might be somebody in this so building under the sound of my voice You're dealing with a call to preach I feel burdened to say that Maybe you're dealing with a call to preach We got a wreath plenish Maybe God's been dealing with you all weekend about the call to preach I feel led to say that Somebody in this Give building. Him the for what he's done in your heart. He took you 
from sin and strife and gave a get the words to how marvelous, how wonderful. Heavenly Father, Lord, to the best of our ability, Father, we preach what you laid on our heart. God, I thank you for the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. God, the same power that was in the little synagogue in Nazareth. God, I pray, Lord, for what's happened here today. God, that you would take it, that you would seal it. God, we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise for every decision made here for Christ. And all God's people said, Brother Chris. What a message, amen.